Well, good morning, RFA Church family. I hope all is going well with you. Listen, you have heard some real news this week. You've heard some fake news this week. And so can I give you some good news this week? Good news, this just in. Jesus is still alive. Jesus is still on the throne. Jesus is still in control. Jesus is still coming back. That's the best news I can share with you this morning. And look, that news, listen to me, that news makes all the difference in the world. When you realize Jesus is big, mighty, powerful, and you're part of Christ's body, when you understand that, everything begins to change. Uh, I've heard all kinds of different quotes this past week and seen memes online and that type thing. Can I tell you, look, with this coronavirus thing, we're all dealing with our own fears and issues and challenges. My challenges have been like, do we keep the doors of this church open? I've got people pressure me to keep it open. I've got people pressure me to shut the doors. Uh, part of my pressure has been, okay, what about income and helping all these uh, different uh, individuals that we have on staff here at RFA Church, how we're going to provide for them. And I'm going to tell you a great quote that has really uh, helped me for the last couple of weeks. It may not mean anything to you, but it's meant a lot to me. It's from, it's from Leonard Ravenhill. He was one of these tough, old, kind of grumpy saints of the faith. And Leonard Ravenhill said, wait a second. I got God, Jesus, and two-thirds of the angels on my side. What am I supposed to do, sit around and cry all day? Listen, Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, is on our side. And if God be for us, who can be against us? And uh, so at any rate, church, I hope all is going well with you. And um, I'm going to share this, I think, a little bit in my sermon, but just in case I forget, this coming Wednesday from uh, 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock, we're going to be taking food here at RFA Church. Uh, we're going to be putting some stuff online about this and some, some parameters here. But we're going to be bringing in food this Wednesday from 11 to 1 and partnering with the Raleigh Dream Center in distributing that food to some needy areas. And so uh, I want you to file that away and think about that. This coming Wednesday, come out from 11 to 1, just drop off some food, and, um, and we're going to bless some people. Well, I don't know about you, but I've been given all kinds of advice about how to handle the coronavirus. And uh, I've seen some advice online. I've seen it on Facebook. Let me give you some um, some kind of funny advice I've, I've heard. Um, one, this is true, somebody said, look, every time you leave your house, you need to have a box of sheets, like bed sheets, in your car, and you need to cover everything, driver's seat, passenger seat, back seat, cover everything with sheets. And when you go out, sit on those sheets, and when you come back home, first thing you do is put on gloves, take off all those sheets, put in the washing machine, and disinfect those sheets, or burn them if you want to. Hey, look here. I'm not doing that, okay? I'd rather just go and get the coronavirus and get it over with. I'm not going to do silly stuff like that, okay? Here's some more advice. This comes from a, um, a county commissioner in Florida who said, uh, you know, we have found that if you blow hot air up your nose with a hair dryer, it will kill the coronavirus. It doesn't work, but I love that. Take a hair dryer, blow it up your nose, and you'll kill the coronavirus doesn't work. I've heard this. Gargle with bleach. It'll kill the coronavirus. Look at here. I'm begging you. Do not gargle with bleach. It does not work. I've heard, here's some more advice. Gargle with essential oils. Gargle with salt water. Gargle with ethanol. All kinds of advice out there. Don't do it. It doesn't work. But since everybody's kind of handing out um, advice on how to handle the coronavirus, y'all mind if I hand out some advice from the Bible today? I want you to go back, if you would, to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 27. We've been going through the book of Acts for over a year now, and now we're at Acts 27. And I'm going to give you some, some, some advice on how to handle the coronavirus from Acts 27. And um, I'll give you the background of this. Remember, the Apostle Paul has been a prisoner for two years at this seaside port of Caesarea. And uh, he has said... As a Roman citizen, I have the right to have my case tried in Rome. So he says, I appeal to Caesar. And the governor says, that's fine. We'll put you in chains, put you on a ship, and we'll take you to Italy, to, uh, to Rome, and uh, we'll let Caesar himself uh, try your case. So two years in prison. Now Paul is put on a ship. Interesting. Skeptics who don't believe um, Luke wrote the book of Acts 
or skeptics who don't believe it was written in the first century have a very hard time with Acts 27 because Acts 27 uh, has nautical terms that only somebody living in the first century would have understood. It has geographical landmarks that are too precise for somebody who did not live at that time to have knowledge of. And so it's very obvious Luke wrote this in the first century. Acts chapter 27, verse 1, advice on, um, on handling the coronavirus. Look at this. When the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius, a captain of the Imperial Regiment. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was also with us. We left on a ship whose home port was uh, Adramidium on the northwest coast of the uh, province of Asia. It was scheduled to make several stops at ports along the coast of the province. The next day, we docked at Sidon. Julius was very kind to Paul and let him go ashore to visit with friends so that they could provide for his need. Let me give you one, one piece of advice in dealing with this coronavirus. Uh, virus. Number one, stay connected. Stay connected somehow, some way. Stay connected. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, stay connected with other believers. Because I want you to see this. Verse 3, uh, the, um, the first person plural pronoun is used. Luke uses the word we. Why is that? Well, because Luke has been... Um, I believe, doing an investigation to write his Gospel of Luke for the last two years while his friend Paul has been in prison. Now that Paul is out of prison, Luke says, hey, Paul, I'm going to go to Rome with you. And I wonder if Paul says, hey, Luke, it's dangerous. I could be executed. They may arrest you. Luke says, I don't care. You're my friend. Thank God for friends like Luke who are with you in good times and in bad times. Paul stay connected with Luke. And I want you to see this in, in verse 3. It says, the next day we docked at Sidon, and uh, we went ashore to visit with friends to provide for Paul's needs. And interesting, when they docked, the apostle Paul goes to this Roman official and says, can I go meet with some friends? I've got some Christian friends in this town. Can I go meet with them? Now, Julius must have really uh, trusted the apostle Paul. Because uh, as a commanding officer, if his prisoner escapes, Julius will be executed. But Julius says, yeah, you, you can go and you can meet with your friends. And that word needs, they provided for his needs, is actually a medical term. So evidently Paul's dealing with some physical issues at this time. But here's, here's my point. Whether it be Paul connecting with Luke or Paul connecting with his Christian friends there inside him, Paul understood the necessity of staying connected with Christian friends. Listen, I've, I've heard some things and seen some things online during this coronavirus things with Christians posting. And look, it's well-meaning. They don't mean anything by it. But Christians posting things like this. Well, the good thing about the coronavirus is that we're learning that we don't have to gather together to be the church. We can be the church in our own homes watching our computers. We don't have to come together to be the church. Listen to me. No, 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 and a thousand times over, No. What we're doing now is not normal. It is temporary. But the New Testament view of the body of Christ is, no, we gather together. The Christian life was never meant to be lived out in your living room, you and your computer dressed in your bathrobe. That is not the Christian life. That is not being the church. So please stop posting these things of, uh, you know, the, the, the church can, uh, can be in separate homes in front of our computers by ourselves. That's not the body of Christ. It's important as followers of Jesus Christ during this, this time, we've got to stay connected. Listen, at least 59 times in the New Testament, there's this admonishment to come together and to do things like bear one another's burdens and be with one another. And that's the normal Christian life. You isolate yourself as a follower of Jesus, you're in danger. In fact, um, <laughs> Darla and I have been watching this. Uh, it's a BBC uh, like a documentary series on, uh, on animals, and it's kind of a win-win. Darla can tell everybody we're getting cultured because we're watching the British Broadcasting Corporation. I get to watch animals kill each other, and it's very interesting. No matter what part of the planet you're looking at, when predators come after a pack of their prey, predators, it's very interesting. I don't know if you're a lion, a cheetah, whatever you are, predators always do this. They try to separate uh, somebody from the pack, 
and they make that separation work to their favor, and the predator can kill the prey when the prey is separated from the pack. And I believe that's how the enemy works in the body of Christ. If the enemy can separate you from the body of Christ, he can come after you. He can eat your lunch. And so the Apostle Paul is basically modeling something for us in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the crisis, somehow, some way, stay connected to other believers. Right now, it might have to be through telephone and email or whatever, but stay connected to the body of Christ. Let's keep going. Look at verse 9. Luke said, we had lost a lot of time. The weather was becoming dangerous for sea travel because it was so late in the fall, and Paul spoke to the ship's officers about it. Men, he said, I believe that there's trouble ahead if we go on. Shipwreck, loss of cargo, and danger to our lives as well. But the officer in charge of the prisoners listened more to the ship's captain and the owner than to Paul, which you can't blame him. Paul is a prisoner in chains, and he's trying to lecture ship's captains about when they can and can't sail. So I understand that. But look at verse 14. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength called a northeaster burst across the island and blew us out to sea. The sailors couldn't turn the ship into the wind, so they gave up and let it run before the gale. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and the stars until at last all hope was gone. No one had eaten for a long time. Finally, Paul called the crew together. Now, keep in mind, this ship has 276 people total, okay? It's a large ship. And so he calls the crew together and says, men, you should have listened to me in the first place and not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. Aren't you glad the apostle Paul is a human being just like us? He basically says... I'm right, you're wrong. Nana, nana, nana. And so look at verse 22. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said, but we will be shipwrecked on an island. Okay, so number one piece of advice, stay connected. Number two, jot this down. Speak more faith than you do fear. Speak more faith than you do fear. Paul, listen. Paul is up front about the fearful facts. Paul does not dodge reality. Paul's very clear. We're in a bad situation here. Church, let me be very clear. <laughs> We're in a bad situation here. This coronavirus and the panic that's involved, it's not great. The economy is not great. Paul was up front. He, he understood that they were in a fearful situation. He didn't dodge the facts. He addressed that fear. Look at verse 10. Men, I believe there's trouble ahead if we go on, shipwreck, loss of cargo, danger to our lives. Verse 22, Paul is very upfront. Men, this ship is going to sink. It's going down. Verse 26, men, we're going to shipwreck on an island. So he's very clear we are in a tough situation. But I want you to see all the other things he says as well. He also spoke faith. He says, verse 22, take courage. Verse 22, none of you will lose your lives. Verse 23, last night an angel stood beside me. Verse 24, an angel told me not to be afraid. Verse 25, take courage. Uh, verse 25, I believe, I have faith in God. Verse 25, it's going to be just as God said. Listen, it almost looks like for every one fearful fact Paul spoke, he spoke two statements of faith. Now, now listen, I love you. And if you're not a member of the RFA Church family, you can zone out for just a second because I am shepherding this flock and I'm going to take my shepherd staff and gently um, uh, tap some of my sheep here. I love you. But when you, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, have 90 to 100% of your Facebook posts being fearful, that's a sin against God. When 90 to 100% of your Facebook posts are how bad the coronavirus is, the body count that they're projecting, when that's all you are posting, I love you, but that's a sin against God. Can we do, let's make a little gentleman's agreement here. Let's do like Paul did. 
Why don't you do this? For one negative post you have, you're going to have two positive posts saying, but God is in charge, God is in control, we're going to get through this thing. Paul spoke more faith than he did fear. Now, again, I love you, but the, re the reason why some of y'all are depressed and you're anxious and you're just barely hanging on is all you're doing is talking the negative mess over and over and over again. In fact, years ago, the pastor of uh, the largest church in the world at the time, David Yonggi Cho, said this, quote, listen to this, this is interesting. Pastor Cho said, one day I was having breakfast with one of the leading neurosurgeons in Korea. He said to me, Dr. Cho, now this is a neurosurgeon, he said, Dr. Cho, did you know that the speech center in our brain rules over all of our other nerves? He says this, you ministers, you pastors really have power because our recent findings in neurology show us that the speech center in the brain rules over all the other nerves. If someone keeps saying, I am weak, then all the other nerves begin to say, okay, let's get weak, for they have received command from the nerve center. If someone keeps saying, I am old, I'm worn out, then all the other nerves follow suit because they have received a command from the nerve center. Isn't that amazing? I wonder what would happen in the midst of this crisis if you started saying things like this, I'm more than a conqueror through him who loved me. God is for me. If God is for me, who can be against me? My God will supply all of my needs according to the riches in Christ Jesus. I wonder what would happen if for every one reality, one fearful reality we spoke, we spoke two positive realities, but God is still in charge. Does this make sense? There's a uh, story in the Wall Street Journal a couple years ago. Talked about a 2015 study that was published in the journal Brain and Behavior and it showed that repeating words can calm your brain and make you healthier. And the Wall Street Journal even talked to, about a woman from Raleigh who wrestled with a medical condition. She had gained 50 pounds, lost much of her hair, and she reversed that, that uh, medical condition by changing the words that she spoke from negative to positive. And so I just want you, look, whatever you have to do, find something you keep saying positive over and over and over again. For me... In the middle of this thing, I keep, now this is going to sound really 101, I got it. But in the middle of this uh, corona thing and all this, I keep saying this, but God's in control. Now that may not mean like, well, yeah, yeah, God's in control. It's amazing how when you just start repeating, God is in control, God is in control, at some point you begin to think God is in control and it just breaks that anxiety. Now some of you are saying, well, God's in control, I don't like what God is doing. <laughs> I love what J. Vernon McGee said. Because some of y'all are saying, Pastor, you're saying God is in control? Well, I don't like the way God's doing this coronavirus thing. Here's what J. Vernon McGee says. This is God's universe, and God does things his way. You may have a better way, but you don't have a universe. This is God's universe. God is in charge. God is in control. So stay connected. Speak more faith than fear. And then look at this, verse 33. Just as day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat okay 276 people on board paul becomes the de facto leader how does that happen he's just a prisoner on the way to rome paul becomes the leader of the ship and he says you have been so worried that you haven't touched food for two weeks he said please eat something now for your own good for not a hair of your heads will perish then he took some bread gave thanks to god before them all broke off a piece and ate it then everyone was encouraged and began to eat. All 276 of us who were on board, after eating, the crew lightened the ship further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. Here's my third piece of advice if you're going through the corona mess now. Number, number three, serve other people. Do you see that in verse 34? Paul is concerned about the welfare of everybody else. It's not about Paul. Paul says, I'm concerned about you. You all need to eat. You all need to take care of yourselves. And Paul kind of led the way in making sure everybody just calms down and gets something to eat. You know, I saw several peer-reviewed studies online this past week that basically said the same thing. These multiple peer-reviewed studies said this. Serving others lowers your depression. If, if you're anxious and if you're depressed, serving other people actually lowers your depression and your anxiety. 
Uh, that's why some of y'all did this this past week. We partnered with an incredible ministry called Chi Alpha. It's a, the Chi Alpha College Student Ministry. And some of you all brought food to RFA Church. Chi Alpha took that food, packaged it, and delivered it to international students who are stranded here in Raleigh. And I, I did that for two reasons. Number one, I thought, man, if, uh, if that was my kid stranded in a foreign country and couldn't get back home, I'd be nervous and scared to death about them. And so I want to do with these kids what I'd want those foreign countries to do with my kids. And so that's the first reason we did this. But the second reason, I did it for you. Because I really feel like we as a church in the time of this crisis need to get out of our own skin and serve others because when we serve others, it actually lowers our anxiety and our depression. And it was amazing how y'all responded. In fact, it was kind of sad. We got one, um, we got one email from uh, one of these international students. Maybe it was, I think it's a lady. She said, look, I'm an international student. I'm stranded here. Uh, I need food. I need some toiletries. I need whatever. And so she, she just kind of sent this in and said, I, I do have this need. And it was very sad. It was almost like she was saying, hey, I, I got to tell you this up front, full disclosure. Incidentally, I am a Muslim. Almost as if if I tell them I'm a Muslim, they may not come over. I don't care if you're Muslim, Buddhist, atheist. We just want to help people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're doing this again this Wednesday from 11 to 1. And again, we'll, we'll post the parameters online. But bring food in. This time we're going to give it to Raleigh Dream Center, and they're going to distrib uh, distribute that food in some needy areas. Does that make sense? Well, pastor, you know, I'm hungering down in my bunker like a doomsday prepper. I can't come out. i got to stay in. i got to take care of my family. Okay, that's fine. Sit around sad, sick, and sorry if you want to. But the rest of us are going to get it out of our skin, and we're going to go bless other people because they need it, and I need it. I have a need to serve others in the midst of the storm, and when that happens, that depression and anxiety is broken. Number four, jot this down. Understand in, in the midst of this crisis, in the midst of the storm, understand the contagion of your emotions. This amazes me. The Apostle Paul is a low-level prisoner chained on this prison ship with 276 people. But he is a spirit-filled child of the Most High God, and his emotions are contagious. In fact, look back at verse uh, 35. Paul says, look, y'all haven't eaten. we got to eat. And Paul just says, let's, let's just start eating, verse 35. Let me walk you through this. Let's start eating. And as a result, verse 36, everybody on board was encouraged, and they all began to eat. Paul's emotions were incredibly contagious. Your emotions, mom and dad, in this storm are incredibly contagious when it comes to your kids. They need to have a mom and dad that are displaying the confidence that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're depressed, they'll be depressed. If you're anxious, they'll be anxious. If you're bold and confident, they'll be bold and confident. In fact, I uh, refer to this all the time. Uh, Daniel Goleman, who's a uh, psychiatrist, Daniel Goleman uh, wrote a book a few years ago called Primal Leadership. And he said this. He said, the limbic system in our brain is hardwired to take our cues from our leaders. If our leaders display this emotion, the organization will display the same emotion. If our leaders are confident, the organization will become more confident. If our leaders are depressed, the organization will become depressed. And he's now, we believe it's God, he says it's evolution, but our brain has been designed in such a way where it takes excuse from its leaders. If you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you by definition are some type of influencer. I'm, I'm saying, in the midst of this storm, be bold and be strong. I'll tell you something, fear is contagious. I, I've seen it with this cor coronavirus thing. In fact, here's what Pastor Doug Wilson says. Listen to this. The virus has killed its thousands, and the panic has killed its ten thousands. When a panic takes hold, there is no reasoning with it in the moment. A little while back, a couple weeks ago, the Imperial College in the U.K., set off some of this panic, this frenzy. You have an influencer at the Imperial College who says, our models have shown that when the coronavirus hits the UK, 500,000 people will die in the UK and 2.2 million Americans will die. You know what's interesting this past week? He's come back and said, well, our models were off uh, just a little bit. Uh, instead of 500,000 deaths in the UK, we may have 20,000 deaths. 
That's a lot different than 500,000. But what happened is that set off a panic. And in America, we were talking about morgues and bodies being laid out on the streets and not having enough place to bury people and all this kind of stuff. And now, uh, yesterday, it's kind of interesting, Dr. Uh, Burks at the White House press briefing said, no, it's actually not going to be $2 million. It's not even going to be close to that. But what happened? A few influential people started to panic, and there's a trickle-down effect, and the rest of us panicked. This is not the time to, to get into this. I'll, I'll wait till this mess is all over. I'm just going to ask you to do this. When all this is over, I want you to remember who panicked and who didn't panic. Because what I have seen go on in our culture bothers me greatly. I have people call me up immediately. Pastor, shut the church down. Why? Well, this is, uh, this is two times more um, contagious than the common flu. Okay. Then I had somebody else. Pastor, uh, I don't know we had so many connections with the CDC here at RFA. Well, my brother-in-law's cousin uh, at the uh, CDC said, no, this is 10 times more uh, deadly than the uh, flu. Wow, 10 times. Yeah. And then I had literally, I'm not making this up. Somebody called me up. Hey, uh, you know, my next door neighbor, uh, he's, uh, he's got some connections with the CDC through his mom's um, aunt. And they're now saying this is 14 times more deadly than the annual flu. 14, wow, okay. Uh, Pastor Chad, shut the church down. Why? This, no, this is the latest one I, I heard. Last, last one I heard was this. Pastor, this thing is 20 times more contagious and deadly than the seasonal flu. Wow, 20, 20 times, okay. But, and I've been sitting back this whole time saying, this is just human nature. We get whipped up into a frenzy, and we start forwarding emails, and suddenly that panic gets out of control. And, you know, you actually see this in the Old Testament. There are several examples of this in the Old Testament. For example, 1 Samuel 14, 20, the Philistines go to battle against the Israelites, and it says in 1 Samuel, panic, confusion set in, and the Philistines take their swords, and they're so panicked and confused, they turn on each other and start killing each other. And I've, I've seen that here in America and even in the body of Christ. Those of the sword turn on those who aren't as panicked as they are, and they're upset that you're not as panicked as I am, and we turn on each other. And I'm just telling you, a panic and fear is contagious. I'm going to tell you this as well. Confidence is contagious. A.W. Tozer says, a scared world needs a fearless church. Confidence is contagious. Hey, joy is contagious. David Jeremiah said this years ago. I love this. David Jeremiah said, Quote, joy is contagious, and to catch the infection, you have to expose yourself to the virus and become part of the blessed epidemic. Maybe we can start a counter epidemic in the body of Christ of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's contagious as well. So in the midst of this storm, let, let, let me give you some advice. Number one, stay connected with other believers. Number two, speak more faith than fear. Number three, serve others. And then number four, just understand the contagion of your emotions. Well, church, let's start closing this thing down. In my estimation, Paul the Apostle never shined brighter in the book of Acts than when this storm hit. I love the book of Acts, and Paul has some great moments. In my mind, his greatest practical moment comes in Acts chapter 27 when the storm hit. The, the, the storm brought out the hero in the Apostle Paul. When I was a kid, I used to love um, superheroes. You know, watching superhero cartoons and reading superhero you know, comic books, whatever. It's kind of interesting. There was always a Superman inside of Clark Kent. But when a crisis hit... The crisis brought Superman out of the phone booth to go take care of the crisis. There was always a Batman inside of Bruce Wayne. But when a crisis hit, the crisis brought Batman out of the Batcave to go handle the crisis. There was always the Incredible Hulk inside of Bruce Banner. But when a crisis came, it brought the Incredible Hulk out of the skin of Bruce Banner and he took care of business. Beloved, listen to me. We are the body of Christ. 
You and I are superheroes, supermen and superwomen of God. We have a big S on our chest for spirit-filled believers. And I believe that this crisis called the coronavirus is going to bring the church outside of its walls and the supermen and superwomen of God are going to shine bright for the Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, for the last couple of weeks, I've seen people quoting and uh, posting Psalm 91. In fact, Pastor Vic had a great uh, devotional yesterday based on Psalm 91. And here's what I'm saying to the body of Christ. Maybe it's time that we stop quoting Psalm 91 and posting Psalm 91 and start living Psalm 91. That he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the foulest snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find protection. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only see with your eyes and observe the punishment of the wicked. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent for he will give his angels command concerning you to guard you in all your ways they will lift you up in their hands that you'll not strike your foot against the stone you will tread upon the lion and the cobra you will trample the great lion and the serpent because he loves me says the lord i will rescue him i will protect him for he acknowledges my name he will call upon me and i will answer him i will be with him in trouble i will deliver him and honor him and with long life will i satisfy him and show him my salvation super men and women of god let's come out and do something incredible for the lord jesus christ in these dangerous dangerous times would you pray with me right now and as we're praying you may be listening today and you're like where's all this hope come from Man, how, how can i have this kind of confidence he's talking about one word jesus jesus those of us who are standing strong in the midst of this storm, we have confidence, not in our government, not in the president, not, not, definitely not in Congress. Our confidence is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because, now listen to me, this is the most important news you'll ever hear. We have rebelled against the holy God of the universe. We are separated from God because of our sins. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. But 2,000 years ago, that God became a man, and that man's name was Jesus Christ. And every wicked sin you and I have ever committed, he took the punishment for at the cross. Jesus Christ died in your place. He was buried, and three days later, God raised him from the dead. He is alive today. And this is so important. If you'll simply turn from your sins and turn to Jesus and surrender the control of your life over to Jesus, the moment you surrender to Jesus, God's Spirit comes to live inside of you. God forgives you of all of your sins. He adopts you as His child. And when you die, you will go to heaven to be with the Lord forever. My past is taken care of. My present is secure. My future is in the hands of God. When I surrender to Jesus Christ, God takes care of everything, past, present, and future. And if you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, I want to help you right now. I, I, want you, I want to lead you in a prayer. Now, prayers don't save anybody. Re repeating mantras doesn't save anybody. Jesus says somebody. That he, he's the one that saves. So I want you to zone everybody else who might be out of your or in, in your room right now. And I want you to imagine it's just you and Jesus. And I want you to say this to Jesus. And I want you to mean this with all of your heart. Jesus, I am a sinner. Lord, I'm a messed up person. But Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. In other words, some of this, Jesus, I, I believe you took my punishment. I believe you were buried. And I believe three days later, God raised you back to life. And I say to him, I believe you're alive right now. Now, this is so important. Say, so, Lord, I turn away from all of my sin. I turn to you. Now, say this is going to be the most powerful thing you've ever said. Say this to the Lord right now. Jesus, take control of my life. Forgive me of all my sins and take me to heaven when I die. 
Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, hang in there. God's in control. Everything is going to be okay. I want you to raise your hands and receive this blessing now. Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen and amen. God bless you, beloved. Let's go change this world for Jesus Christ. 